All right, welcome to Bet the Edge. I'm Jay Croucher here with Drew Dinsick. We're recording on Monday late afternoon. AMA show today. We're also going to hit some some puck, uh, some NHL awards at the end. But Drew, let's start off with our first question from uh, at Ice Ice Mapsy. Very good. <laughs> Sixers schedules easing up. Embiid news should be coming in the next week, but by all accounts should be fairly positive. Melton Batum just came back. Covington getting closer. I'm a biased Sixers fan, but it feels like after Boston, uh, this is the best buy low for futures. The Sixers price 18 to 1, 20 to 1, that type of range. Uh, what do you think about betting the Sixers to win the East? Yeah, uh, so news is starting to trickle in. Last time we talked Sixers, last time we talked East, I think it was sort of the, um, you know, who is who is you know the most likely uh, to challenge? Uh, is it the Celtics themselves doing something, um, you know, to derail their hopes, uh, or is there a real challenger? And uh, you know, the big question still remains: is how healthy will Embiid ultimately be? Um, and when we start to get a better sense of that, I think you're going to see a huge shift in this price because, uh, you know, eight, you know, what, what are they? Fifth choice, sixth, sixth choice <laughs> right now to win the East is kind of crazy. Uh, longer price than the heat, uh, is kind of insane. Um, and so I think ultimately, uh, you know, the, the evidence proof of life, uh, for, for a beat is going to crater this price uh and uh you know reports towards the end of last week and into the weekend uh seem to be suggesting that yeah he is going to um be back potentially even before the playoffs so he'll get a little bit of uh the end of the regular season to tune up and um you know the rest of the Sixers team it leaves me a little cold um obviously we're pretty clearly on record about Maxi's um you know it's just a little bit of a, a swoon from him you know a little bit of a regression here because he's been the one that has had to carry all the offense and uh you know that comes with the cost of you know just increased fatigue um and I think uh you know the rest of the pieces there the move to get Buddy healed like didn't move the needle a ton for me uh and you know you're up against what is i think on paper a perfectly complete team in the celtics so um can the sixers win two games in a, in a best of seven against the celtics absolutely um you know is is now the right time to enter the market in terms of price absolutely uh and but i think ultimately i'm uh i'm more inclined to just uh, expect that boston uh, gets through the East losing something like maybe four games total. Uh, and, you know, maybe I'm being a little bit, uh, you know, too pie in the sky optimistic for a team that has only ever done, you know, gotten to the finals once. But, um, you know, they have every year mark to me of uh, kind of your super team this year. Yep, I agree. Uh, the Celtics price is starting to now some spots dip to, you know, almost minus money, which I think is, is fair. Uh, even when you bake in, the health concerns, like I think we talked about this the other day, but what's, what's the maximum price that the Celtics can be in a series in the East? Like, is it minus 250? Like, is that if Milwaukee really starts rolling? Like the Celtics, like we talked about, they close seven-point favorites home to Denver um, and they're rolling at the moment. And also they're probably the best team in NBA history in terms of their positioning to be fully healthy for the playoffs just with – uh one how they can load manage to the relative youth of the, all of their key players and then three this massive lead that they've got for the one seed so certainly does feel like their conference i don't think they're you know entirely infallible but relative to this field they might be on the sixes i did back some sixes 30 to one to win the east uh when we were out in vegas just on the idea that you know, if Embiid comes back, they they may well be the second best team in the East. Now, the issue is, is that they are currently in some spots minus four sixty to participate in the play-in tournament. So that is very likely coming. The schedule's not easy. They're only one game ahead of eight. Uh, sorry, they're one and a half games ahead of eighth, uh, which is Orlando, who are tied with Miami, uh, Philadelphia, they should be worse the rest of the way than Indiana, Miami, and Orlando. They're just not as good when they don't have, as those teams when they don't have Embiid. Now, I guess the good thing would be that uh, they're not going to fall to nine because they're six games clear of Chicago in ninth. So they're very likely going to get the double chance in the play-in, assuming they fall into that. And if Embiid is back and he's had you know two, three weeks to ramp up, there's a good chance that they're favoured in that first playing game. And if they win that, then all of a sudden they're the seven and you're on the opposite side of the bracket to Boston. Uh, and then I think it becomes a bit more doable 
and the supporting cast it's not like it's not super super inspiring but at the same time like this team was before Embiid started having issues with his knees like they were in the five to one range to win the east uh, and if they're going to be that same team but now with with Buddy Heald who is useful with Kyle Lowry who I think can still be useful as well like they do have a depth of competence uh, and they may well be the second best team in the East. It's just they're going to have to do it the hard way uh, on the road uh, every series, almost assuredly. The other thing, too, is that I think with Embiid, who has been bad relative to his kind of established regular season play in the playoffs every single year of his career, basically, and I know that he's been hurt you know, almost every year, but I don't think that that is all just bad luck and all injuries. I do think there is something about the way that Embiid plays which makes him just more defendable in the playoffs and maybe like he was playing at the highest level of his career before he got hurt so maybe he's solved a few of those things become a better passer but I just think with the nature of his game the fact that you know he doesn't move without the ball he's not a, a brilliant passer I do think that he is a little bit more containable in the playoffs um, than you know other players of his ilk, like Jokic and Giannis and Steph, uh, and you know, we'll see about guys like SGA. But what do you think about the idea that Embiid uh, it doesn't get better in the playoffs and might even get worse? I've I've really enjoyed your breakdown because I've been wondering about that myself. If there's something about his style of play, because people are going to make it, uh, you know, a reductive, uh, like doesn't have the playoff mentality kind of thing, and uh, that's not it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. It's not about effort. It's not about guts. This is. It, it, there is something specific about being able to scout a player like that and be. You know, maybe he's a little bit more predictable. Um, <clears throat> I think certainly the fact that you have a best of seven series and um, uh, you know the role of the you know the, the opposing coach is solve this problem right like find a way uh, to contain him uh, and the fact that you see his kind of just in general his production start to tail off later in the, into some of these series that have gone the distance uh, notably against the Celtics last year in a series that went seven games um, you know I did there was a whiff of yeah we're you, you're gonna try as many different styles of matchups as possible on him defensively until you find something that works uh, and you know the the lack of sort of being able to move without the ball and you know the lack of uh, kind of elite passing uh, being two key areas where um, you can contain him just geographically on the court, I think is uh, is very valid. Um, and yeah, it, it uh, it's going to be fa it's it's going to be fascinating to see if anybody can uh, stop the Sixers with the healthy and beat this year in the playoffs. And it's going to be interesting to see whether having missed this portion of time in the season is ultimately beneficial for him because there'll be a lot a lot less um, you know kind of wear on the tires. Uh, I felt like there was some fatigue that was uh, definitely impacting him in the playoffs last year. Where if he wasn't on the MVP crusade, if he had had more kind of load managed. Um, you know, season regular season last year, he might have been a more effective player in uh, in the month of April and May. So it's it's uh, it's going to be pretty fascinating. Um, I'm not taking action right now, despite the I guess if you are playing building out a full portfolio, like and you're really trying to time the buy low, speculating on Embiid coming back and being healthy and being the guy that was the clear MVP before he got hurt, I think is fine. Um, I just uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna sit on it a little bit more, and it's uh, um, I guess. Do you like him? Do you, I guess you 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 went Sixers solely to uh, to ship at thirty to one or East thirty to one? East East, east of thirty okay. to one. Um, That's a great just, price. Yeah, just riding you know the potential upside there. But I think that with MB, the other issue is that like he has a usage rate this year of thirty nine percent. Like that's insane, uh, and I'm not sure that that's. That means that you can't win a title or anything, but I do think it is an issue, particularly for him, given his knees and his issues. Like if he's going to have a 39% usage rate in the playoffs and that's the way that this team has to win, then it's pretty hard to see them going through three series um, with him being able to withstand that type of load. Like maybe he can do it, but that's just another issue. I think as well, like you play out the game of, because whenever you're backing a, a futures price, someone to win a conference or a title, you need to do the math game of like, well, are you better off just backing them series by series? And with the Sixers, like say they do get the seven seed and say that Embiid is healthy. There's still going to be dogs to the Cavs without home court, I think. I think they'd still be dogs to Milwaukee if Milwaukee are the three and their next opponent, given that Milwaukee would have home court and will have won a series and shown some level. 
And then if you presume at that point um, that they're playing Boston in the conference finals, obviously they're going to be dogs there. So even I think an optimistic viewpoint might be like plus 125, plus 150, plus 230, that type of range. And that's getting you to 18 to 1 18. already. And that's yeah. not even counting in that, well, maybe they don't get the seventh seed. Maybe they don't win the first play of game. Maybe MB just never comes back. Like there are a lot of factors there. So I would, I would wait and see because... If Embiid, if it gets declared that he's coming back on March 28, I don't think the 18 to 1 is just collapsing to 10 to 1 immediately. Okay. Like I think you can probably afford to to get a bit more of a look um in this market. But this is the this is the type of team to place a long shot bet on ultimately because they do have potentially the best player in the league just randomly coming back with a decent supporting cast in a conference that's you know wide open outside of one team. Um, so yeah, no, I like the thought process. Uh, question two from our friend, uh, at Cameron underscore H seven is clutch player of the year, a wrap. If Steph Curry plays 65 plus games, he is minus 370 in the market. Now Damian Lillard is 10 to one. Shea Gilgis Alexander 10 to one as well. They're the two main challenges in the market, at least. Uh, what's your read on this one? Yeah, it's worth noting uh, this uh, question came in last week um, when he was minus 200, uh, but we got the question right after recording, so we weren't able to uh, uh, to get it into the mix. Um, what happened between last week and this week that has gotten this much momentum behind him, I guess, is maybe what a question for you. Like, yeah, I, I think he should be the heavy favorite. Minus 370 feels a little... Um, you know, foregone conclusion -y for a, a Warriors team that still has a lot of work to do to get into the playoff field. Um, and I can't really off the top of my head come up with any like standout clutch moments from Curry this year that, uh, uh, you know, really kind of, I would think would cement this type of, uh, of favoritism. Um, can you explain this one a little bit better? Because I kind of, I kind of want to make a case for someone else and feel like, uh, uh, you know, if you go, if you, if you dive, dig hard into sort of the clutch scores, like Giannis stands out clearly as the guy this year. So I'm not exactly sure what's going on in this market at all. And maybe this is just a market where people still don't quite understand the definition and they just kind of coalesce around whoever happens to be the favorite. Like that could be what's going on. I think so. Kyrie he did have the the shot to win the game against Phoenix. That was his one moment. Outside of that, uh, he hasn't had I think superlative individual moments, but he at least does have that as kind of the moment to point to that can be played on his highlight reel at the awards um, ceremony. Um, should they want it, where he kind of reaches for the pass that's slightly behind him from pods, I think, and then he turns around and drains the very Steph Curry type of three to beat uh, the Suns. Now, so he has. So first of all, this award is weird because it's only the second year of the award. So it is a little precarious having an incredibly short favorite in an award that we don't know a ton about. What we know from last year is that the voting was basically one, two, three in terms of just who scored the most total clutch points. Not like per game averages, just your total clutch points. And in that department, and the reason why he's so short, Curry has 165 clutch points in second is DeMar DeRozan with 114 and then Trey Young 107. He's obviously done okay. Lillard 102. And so the gap between first and second, Curry and DeRozan is the same as the gap between like first, second and I don't know, scrolling, 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 like 30th or something. Like Curry has a massive lead in terms of just the raw point total. He's also been extremely efficient, shooting 51% from the field, 48% from three in clutch situations. Obviously, just you know, doesn't miss free throws. So those are the reasons why he is this short. Now, the way that this would fall apart for Curry, there's two things. One, the team isn't that good. Um, they're just narrowly above 500. They're probably going to be a nine or a ten seed, and they only have an 18, 15 record in the clutch. And his plus minus, he's only plus three in the clutch. So that's where it would fall down. Ultimately, though, even with all this. Like he's got a 51 point lead and he's Stephen Curry and he's been super efficient and he did have his moment against Phoenix. So ultimately, I think that the price is, is justified. I think that he will ultimately walk it in so long as he stays healthy. The Warriors don't like totally collapse and then no one comes from the clouds. And I think the clouds have gone pretty far in the rearview mirror at this point. He's got such a lead. Um, I think honestly, if someone were to beat him, like you need to have a really differentiated type of case 
So like uh, Nicole Jokic um, is on this team that has this insane record in clutch games. He's sixth in scoring. Uh, he'll go past Trey almost certainly. His plus minus is plus 48. Like I think those are the type of cases that you need. DeRozan has, you know, a good, uh, he has a great plus minus as well. But again, the team is 16, 13 in the clutch and he's, 51 points behind Curry and the team is also, you know, they're three games under 500. So ultimately I think this is Curry's award, but um, what do you think? Yeah. So I guess I didn't look at it as totals because it's just like, you just sort by totals and players who have played a lot of, a lot of clutch yeah. minutes. It's players that are on, you know, pretty average teams, yeah. right? Like that, it feels weird to have an award that's centered around who's the most, you know the most um impactful player on an average team <laughs> like that's a very very strange kind of uh uh exercise um yeah the three the three num number one number two number three and minutes played in the crutch clutch this year are all chicago kobe white Vucevic, and DeRozan. <laughs> <laughs> then you got curry then you got caruso Dejounte murray for atlanta scotty barnes for toronto pascal siakam uh like th there's just it's there's nobody who except for any you know even milwaukee and you would say well yeah milwaukee's been you know uh, largely disappointing so they've been in more competitive games than you would ever have guessed. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I kind of had just decided I wasn't going to play this market because I just didn't understand yet how people were going to find, you know, kind of, kind of decide uh, around, uh, you know, or kind of coalesce around a candidate. But the fact that you do have uh, such a big name who is so clearly uh, destroying it just in accumulated points uh, in the clutch this year. Uh, and it's just a guy that people feel great about. <laughs> and would, even on, you know, even with a, a Warriors season that may be kind of end of the era, a uh, little bit of a lost season to a degree, uh, does he get the nod just because of this particular stat? That makes sense to me. So uh, this could be a, a runaway. Yep, I think so. All right, spring training is here. So for those looking to get ahead on the upcoming MLB season, grab your Roto World Baseball Draft Guide. It's loaded with comprehensive positional rankings, projections, and player profiles to ensure your draft is a success. Visit NBCSports.com slash draft guide and use code BASEBALL24 to get 10% off at checkout. All right. Uh, question from Chase Gibson to you, Drew, just catching up. Mm. on the uh, 220 bet now regarding uh, Olympic swimming. Anyone an early lean for you? Mm. Very much looking to fully back uh, Summer McIntosh. Yeah, uh, Summer McIntosh is going to be the breakout star of the Paris Olympics by all accounts. Uh, she's Canadian. Uh, so, you know, to our Canadian friends, uh, you know, she's a probably already a household name to some degree. Um, she is coming into the peak of her powers as far as being, you know, an elite world athlete. And uh, she's, I, I think, almost suffers from being too good at too many events, right? As opposed to just having one or two where she can truly dial in and focus and, uh, you know, kind of be the clear, you know, class of the of a specific event and run away with a clear one or two golds. Instead, she's probably in the mix for at least five um she did not uh, compete at uh in the 2024 worlds in doha uh she was a little bit of an underwhelming uh performer at the 2023 worlds back in japan last summer um but uh, i gotta tell you she did a um uh, a competition called the southeastern zones sectional championships uh in the early part of february and she was unbelievably fast in some of the uh, distance freestyle events um she completely took apart katie ledecky in the 800 free first woman to beat katie ledecky in the 800 free going back to i think probably when katie ledecky was like 12 years old um and it's pretty exciting that you have um you know kind of real deal competition in that category for the first time uh she you know broke the canadian record she set her personal you know pr and she's not tapered at this time like she is they uh, both katie and uh, summer by the way specifically skipped the doha worlds like to kind of continue to train that you know they didn't want to kind of break up the um you know the pattern of trying to peak in the middle of summer 2024 um and so you know i think this is giving you a very decent chance. Like Ledecky can clearly swim faster than she swam at this meet, and she was probably treating it more like, um, uh, you know, just training swim as opposed to, you know, 
she's trying to get her, her feet wet competition wise. Um, but the fact that summer went this fast is, is pretty exciting. Uh, and you have three true blue competitors in the, well, I guess maybe Kayla Decky is not really going to be competitive in the foreign free anymore. Maybe it's just a Titmus versus summer kind of head to head there. Um, but, uh, there is also kind of elite talent from all over the world that's emerging in the, uh, kind of middle distance freestyle. So, um, it's going to be, uh, uh, very, very, very competitive. And, um, yeah, I think, uh, kind of specifically keying on summer Macintosh news and info and keeping track of her progression through this, uh, uh, this next few months is going to be well worth it. And it's, I guess maybe just overall a hat tip to, you know, Canada swimming, like they're producing some phenomenal athletes like they had some unbelievable swims on the men's side at worlds that i think took the um you know kind of the community o- overall a little bit by surprise so uh they're obviously they got something going good in the water up in canada and uh it uh it's going to be pretty fascinating to see how you know usa swimming honestly how they respond to the fact that australia has come so so far so fast uh, as far as an elite program goes and now you have canada to deal with as well and uh, you know, China had some phenomenal swims at, uh, at worlds. It's going to be, uh, an extremely competitive Olympics and, uh, team USA better, uh, better start, uh, better start tuning up. Okay. I think that's the first mention we've ever had on the podcast of the Southeastern zone sectional championships. <laughs> um, hopefully not the last, uh, the next question is from at the real underscore HBC, AKA our friend Brinks. Why do you think, Drew, Todd Pletcher chose to race Speedy in the Fountain of Youth race in March versus others in the lead up to the Kentucky Derby? It's a great question. Uh, if you don't know what we're talking about, um, I, I, you know, you, 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 you I, we had a funny conversation last week. We were like, yeah, what are you kicking around that you're betting on? Like, what has really kind of captured your attention, you know, in, in the betting space right now? Well, I'm way, way into Kentucky Derby futures and like really trying to understand how the whole process works. How do you actually identify a horse on the front end of this? Because like, if you're just start doing your homework in the weeks leading up to the race, like you're, you're the, you're the, you're the soft money in the pool. Sorry, to, sorry to inform you of this. But I've learned this the hard way. Um, and so, yeah, it's been fun kind of getting a, a better sense of um, how the current format is informing a lot of the trainers and owners uh, across the sport. And, uh, you know, we had a pretty big sea change around the time that Justify uh, won the Triple Crown. Uh, and Justify, of course, uh, you know, broke the curse of Apollo, which was he was the first um, horse to win the Kentucky Derby in 100 years or whatever, uh, because uh, the first horse to win who had not raced as a two year old, uh, you know, kind of the conventional wisdom uh, was, you know, get your horse's feet. Uh, you know, get them some racing uh, experience as a two-year-old. Uh, they enter their three-year-old year. Uh, by the way, if you didn't know, in the parlance of horse racing, all horses turn three years old on January 1st, the year that was three years after they were born. Uh, so some of these horses, you know, are a little bit younger and they, uh, you know, trainers and owners have elected not to race them uh, as two-year-olds as often. Justify proves you can win the derby doing that path. Mage last year was another example of a two-year-old, of a horse that did not race as a two-year-old coming on in his three-year-old year and uh, getting, to, you know, getting across the line. Uh, and so there you're seeing a lot more of that now uh, and speakeasy is one of those horses where uh, didn't race at all as a two-year-old complete unknown uh, heading into this year's uh, you know tune-up races warm-up races uh, and uh, the road to qualifying to the Kentucky Derby is pretty regional right like you have horses that are kind of all coming up at the same time in their three-year-old years in Florida in Arkansas uh, Louisiana New York uh, and you know Kentucky uh, and there are different prep races in each region. Oh, California as well, obviously. The Santa Anita Derby is coming up on like April 4th, I think. But uh, all, you know, all the little regions kind of have their, uh, you know, young colts and, and, uh, 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 and bring them up through a qualifying process where you get points uh, to qualify to run in the Derby. You typically need around 40 points in order to qualify, and you get points by finishing in the top five of some of these qualifying races. And so there's a lot of strategy in terms of you, you know, you want, you want to have your, your horse, uh, you know, kind of break, break their maiden in style. Speakeasy did. Uh, he ran a, an undercard race uh, on the day, I think of the, um, was it the Risen Star? I can't remember which, which uh, race day it was. Uh, but, uh, might've been the Pegasus. I'm forgetting. Anyway, uh, he ran an undercard race. He was phenomenal. He put up the best speed time of any of the three-year-old, uh, uh, hopefuls. Uh, and now they got to try his hand against, uh, some of the, uh, kind of known quantities, some of the horses that did run as two-year-olds, some of the horses that have won graded stakes. Uh, 
Uh, and so they're going to run speakeasy here at the Fountain of Youth. Uh, this looks to be the most competitive of all of the tune-up races that are happening this weekend. Um, the way it works out is you'll have kind of an early March set of races, a late March, early April set of races, and then that gives the horses times to recover before the, uh, the first Saturday in May when they run the Derby. Um, and, uh, Todd Fletcher, obviously one of the more experienced trainers in, in, in the world. Um, and, uh, he liked, you know, saw enough in speakeasy in his, uh, in his maiden, um, debut, uh, and has elected to put him into this field in the fountain of youth against, uh, two of the effectively the co-favorites. Um, and, uh, and so it's going to be a big race on Saturday. Excited to see if he could back up what was just a pretty, uh, phenomenal performance, uh, holding a lot of uh, futures right now on Speakeasy to do well. And uh, even if, you know, something, if it doesn't pan out this year, it's been a good learning process to kind of understand sort of the current uh, state of the sport and how they're, you know, kind of bringing the horses along these days uh, in these tune-up races. But uh, yeah, Fountain of Youth this week in Florida is going to be all I must watch uh, for anyone who is uh, kind of playing the futures pool right now. Okay, there you go. I think we'll have uh, more Kentucky Derby content leading up to the race, which is largely going to be carried by yourself. Uh, I believe we may be going back to Kentucky for the Derby. I'm not 100% sure there. But, uh, that 100, 150th run this year. It's a big deal. Yeah, that's a big one. All right, well, from the racetrack uh, to uh, the puck, uh, we're going to close out talking some Hart Trophy and Jack Adams Trophy uh, awards markets in the NHL. Uh, I think both of these are fascinating um, in their own right. To me, the heart is, uh, I love these type of award markets where it's just a kind of comparison of different archetypes, kind of know what each type of case is. Stands in stark contrast to say like the NBA most improved player market right now, which is just like a mess. And I think that is really just going to move off of polling and what people say because all these cases are so violently different and you don't know what is going to resonate at least i don't really know with great confidence what is going to resonate i just don't think tyrese maxi should be minus 250 um but with the heart trophy you have all of these archetypes where nikita kucherov who just will not die in this market he is the favorite to win the art ross which is the trophy given out to the player who scores the most points he is six points clear of the rest of the league, uh, Nathan McKinnon is in second. Um, Kucherov has, he has, what does he have now? 40 points more than his closest teammate in scoring, which is Braden Point, 62 points. Uh, so he is just the, the point accumulator. His issue is that his team just isn't very good. Like they're not even a lock to make the playoffs. They likely will, but they're going to be, you know, fourth in their division and kind of scrape in and his advanced stats aren't good because he doesn't offer much defensively and he's got a plus minus of plus four on the season. It's not very good. Uh, he's also an empty net merchant uh, is uh, Peter. Uh, Nathan McKinnon, who has been the favorite for quite a while. Um, I should also just say Austin Matthews right now is plus 150. Uh, at least the bet MGM, Nathan McKinnon plus 200, Kucherov plus 300, Connor McDavid plus 350. That there probably ends your list of realistic candidates. Um, that we'll talk about one long shot at the end. But uh, McKinnon was the favorite for a long stretch. He's kind of they've cooled off a little bit. The Avs, his pace has cooled off a little bit as well, though he's still at 96 points. He has much better advanced stats than Kucherov. Connor McDavid, who's still Connor McDavid, who's still the guy that everyone thinks is the best player in the world, he's third in point scoring. He has a better plus minus uh than any of the of, well he's got a better plus minus than Kucherov and McKinnon and the issue is is that he's just not having a superlative Connor McDavid season the Oilers are kind of messing around at the moment sneaky thing is though is that he does have six games in hand um on those top two guys uh I believe six yeah it might be four five games or so but anyway he's got a lot of um additional games where he can make up points but to me the market, it revolves around the other guy, and he's the favorite of the MGM. He's not the favorite of other places. That's Austin Matthews, who in 56 games has scored 52 goals. Um, that is completely insane. The second highest <laughs> goal scorer in the league is Sam Reinhardt with 39. Now, Matthews is on pace right now to get to 70-plus goals, and that hasn't been done uh, since 1992-93. There's been 30, it's going to be more than 30 years since anyone has got the 70 goals. 
It's not like Austin Matthews is some random dude either. Like he won the Hart Trophy two years ago. He's considered one of the five best players on the planet. He has the pedigree. Uh, he is also uh, a really good defensive forward too. So I kind of think everyone is just overthinking this market because okay. there are guys who have much bigger point totals in Kucherov, um, McDavid, and McKinnon. Austin Matthews, I think you just need to take a step back. Like if he gets to 70 goals which has not been done in over 30 years. He's an excellent defensive forward. He has all the pedigree in the world. He's on a team that has won, I believe, seven straight and is surging and is going to be locked into being top three in the division, ironed on to the playoffs. Uh, he has a plus minus, a plus 24, which is better than everyone uh, in this field. And, and so I think this is just all about can Austin Matthews get to 70 goals? And if he just continues his pace of like the past five years, how he scored at, he will get there. And this, there's another element to this where uh, I think that when an NBA player, when they're on track to score 50 or 60 or 70, these big round numbers, the live player prop market never adjusts to the fact that the team is just going to feed them the ball a ton more than they usually would. And you get this kind of altered um, game state where all of a sudden you can't just like rely on what the player typically does because they're going out of their way to score the goals. I think that's going to happen with Matthews as well. Like if he gets close... They, he's going to go. He's going to be hunting for empty netters like never before. Uh, this is going to be on his mind clearly because it hasn't been done in over thirty years. And so I think that he's odds on to get to seventy. And I think that if he gets to seventy, I, I don't really see how he's going down. So anyway, that is my breakdown of the hard trophy. Uh, is there anything you would like to add? No, I, that's incredible. Um, and you're right. 1992-93 season was the last time we saw 70. And weirdly enough, two guys tied that year with 76. Yeah. <laughs> Solani yeah. and McGillney uh, both had uh, 76 that year. Some of these totals in the 80s, by the way. Wayne Gretzky, 81-82. 92 goals in the season? Oh, what? Yeah. So, like, oh, how are these fights possible? Um, but yeah, that uh, this type of prolific uh, um, goal scoring is, uh, is, is something to see. Uh, and yeah, I, I completely agree that uh, uh, don't overthink that one. Yep. Uh, the, I, yeah. I, I, the other thing too is that I'm saying that if he gets to 70, he's going to win. It's not like he's 0% to win the award if he finishes at 67 goals. Like he can still not get there and win as well. Sure. So I think there are uh, yeah, plenty of paths for, um, for Matthews. I think that he's the horse in this market. Um, the long shot guy, and it's kind of faded, um, but if Matthews was to totally cool off uh, and McKinnon doesn't win his division and the Lightning kind of keep kind of, you know, just being this uninspiring team and McDavid doesn't absolutely surge, I do think there are still very small worlds where Quinn Hughes, uh, who is 40 to 1 in the market, he would be the only other guy I think can even possibly really win the award because the Canucks, they have a path to uh, to winning the President's Trophy. They're like plus 500 in the market to do that. They are likely going to win their division. They're 70, 75% to do that. And Quinn Hughes, who really should walk in the Norris for being the best defenseman in the league, like he right now is at 70 points in 60 games. So it's a little bit of uphill sledding, but he could potentially get to 100 points, which is a hallowed mark for defensemen. He could have, like right now, he's got um, a plus minus of plus 32, oh, which is goodness. better than every other contender by margin. So if he's 100 points, best plus minus by margin of all the contenders, President's Trophy winner, I do think there are worlds where Quinn Hughes could win. But this Matthew surge has kind of tipped the market on its head. But that is one to watch where uh, if Matthews, like if two, three games go by and he's just not scoring, then all of a sudden I think the market becomes a lot more wide open to um, to long shots uh, like young uh, Mr. Quinn Hughes. Uh, all right. Last one for us, just quickly, the Jack Adams Trophy. I've had a few people message me about this one. Rick Tockett is your favorite, minus 300, uh, the coach of the Canucks. Uh, Rick Bonus is second at plus 900. Um, and then you've got uh, the Panthers coach, Maurice, and Peter Laviolette um, at 10 to 1. Um, now, most of the questions I've gotten have been about Peter Laviolette, um, the Rangers coach who, you know, the Rangers, they just reeled off 10 straight wins. So the second favorite for the president's trophy and Tockett and the Canucks were um, spiraling. 
uh, for a stretch where they lost four in a row. Then they had this momentous win against the Bruins the other night mm -hmm. where they scored. Uh, they, yeah. to, they emptied their net and then they scored with like a minute left and then they won um, in overtime, which arrested their slide and I think probably clinched this award, to be fair. But um, oh, with the Rangers... I think with Laviolette, I think he could be an excellent second place finisher, but I don't really <laughs> see his ceiling to beating Pocket unless the Canucks absolutely spiral. Because, um, like this, this Rangers team were at 107 points last year. Um, their mm. point total coming into the season was uh, 100.5. Like they were expected to be really good, they were already really good. And he's projected right now to end up at about 110 points. He's going to improve by three points year on year. Like if they go on an absolute surge again and they, you know, they get to 117 or something and the Canucks completely fall off and the Rangers run away with the President's Trophy, then maybe, but that's a lot longer than 10 to 1. And I know a lot of people who are on Tocket who have been sweating uh, this one and it looked for a while this was just going to be like a Tyler Hero six man of the year, just kind of just firms, 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 just never drifts, never challenged and just wins. And then this little skid kind of opened the door a little bit, but... I don't think the door is really open because this Canucks team was at like, I think 83 points last season. They made the playoffs outside of the COVID season, like once in a decade, they're this tortured franchise. Tocket has come in. They're going to improve by like 25 points. They're heavy favorites to win the division. His price should never get shorter, to, should never get longer to me than their division price. Cause I think the division is pretty close to just auto win. Uh, also, key thing with this one, it is voted on by the broadcasters, um, yeah. not by the typical vote, um, voter pool. And Toggett was working for a broadcaster last season. And everything that I've heard is that he is absolutely adored in those circles. And the guy uh, who uh, was for, for a time has been the second favorite, um, John Tortorella, the Flyers coach, but he's not, not as beloved um, as Toggett. So I think, uh, you know, it's a season long award and people who place their bets early on talk it, getting a little kind of antsy think that this is going to be fine and that he's ultimately uh ultimately going to walk this one in um and it's one of those ones just take a step back you are actually going to go from 83 points to like 109 and win the division like yeah. if he wins the division it's done yeah no the key the key uh kind of nugget that i was looking for there that you brought up was just how well liked is he among the voting block because um you you know ex if this were the NBA, for instance, and you had a New York centric franchise that was doing something really, you know, really important this time of the year, um, then yeah, there would be a, a little bit of a bias, uh, one might say, an East Coast bias, a New York bias uh, in the voting pool. But uh, with the broadcast and the way that it's set up in the NHL awards, it's definitely a different beast. And uh, I can tell you that uh, kind of fitting more of the. Um, you know the the narrative of team that improved the most or just team that was just the, clearly the most outstanding uh you know a team that exceeded expectations the the greatest uh there's a lot of those in the last uh, 10 years as you look down um the list of jack adams winners so uh that would be sort of your kind of alpha um you know kind of you know a clear and obvious case uh combine that with uh, being well liked and i think uh you could probably get them in a bargain right now with minus 300 right yeah, I, I think minus 300 is a bet, honestly. I don't usually like giving that out because then, you know, people might pile into minus 300. But uh, I do think that, that that is value. I think he is more. That implies he's a 75% chance to win, and I think it's more like an 85% chance at this point. I think he could lose the division and still win the award um, as long as they don't collapse. And the other thing here is that what should prevent a collapse is that they have 64% of their remaining games at home which is like nice. impossible, but they have a nine game homestand coming up in March. The teams are just really good. Uh, there's no reason why they should absolutely collapse. The schedule is kind of, I think, mid pack. So I think Tocket um, should, oh. ultimately, should ultimately get it done. Did you know Vancouver was the best home team in hockey? There you go. Well, that'll help with uh, <laughs> nine game homestand right in the thick of uh, when this award is probably going to be yeah. finalized. Yeah. I think the last thing on this one is that I think with the crazy twists and turns that the NFL Coach of the Year market has taken, well, really every year it feels like, certainly the last three where, you know, Vrabel, Dayball, um, and Stefanski were at like relatively long prices with, you know, three weeks left in the season and how that's flipped on its head. 
like the NFL just isn't like the NHL because you're dealing with, you know, a 17 game schedule as opposed to an 82 game schedule. Like narratives get much more entrenched in the NHL and it's just way harder to just flip in a week. Whereas in the NFL, you know, uh, Mike McDaniel loses to the Titans as a 14 point favorite, just one game, like you're out. Sorry, Mike, you can't win the award anymore. Um, and that just doesn't happen in hockey. Like Tonkett just lost four games in a row. Um, just doesn't matter because he, then he beats the Bruins and the slide is arrested and he's back right on the path. So I think that entrenched winners are much more likely to just kind of hold on and win in, in the NBA and NHL just by nature of the 82 game schedule. Yeah. Dagano, by the way, running away with this all of a sudden. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's fair as like in the minus 200 range right now. Um, and uh, that does feel like it's going one direction. I agree. Yeah, I think I'm a little bit surprised by this, but yeah. I thought there would have been more support for Finch, um, given that he was, you know, in possession of the one seed at All Star. It kind of feels like Dagnow is just going to win no matter what, um, yeah. so long as they don't collapse to like a four seed. If they're a top two seed, even if Finch is the one, mm -hmm. I think Dagnow is still going to win. Um, he's just the guy that everyone wants to vote for. Um, yeah. And Minnesota, they just kind of do dumb stuff a lot of the time and i don't think they have the same vibe as okc do and all the polling has been dag now um they have an easy schedule so i think that so long as he's within like two or three games of finch for the one seed um then i think he's he's probably just gonna win um but yeah that that seem, it seems like dag now is very much uh, on the path like his comrade rick tockett um in the park all right, we are done. Don't forget to check out NBCSports.com for more information to help you with your wages. Thanks to those of you watching on the NBC Sports YouTube channel. If you're listening to us in podcast form, don't forget to rate and subscribe. And also a reminder to find all your favorite NBC Sports shows on Amazon Music. Just head to Amazon.com slash NBC Sports. From Jay Croucher and Drew Dinsick, we'll see you soon.